I want to just say a couple words very quickly, and then I want us to sing that again and just enter into the presence of God in a deeper way. But may I just say that in that worship, you know, we come into worship, we got all kinds of things in our mind. We are getting the kids ready. We're getting ourselves ready. We're fighting traffic. We're blah, 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 blah. We run in here, jump on the, start singing and praising. But as we begin to enter in, as we begin to enter in, we enter in his gates with prayer and thanksgiving. And this right now on God's calendar is a very, very important time. If you were here Friday night, we celebrated Shabbat, the great Shabbat, which is called the Shabbat of return. This time in our lives, this time on God's calendar is as we close out the Hebrew can calendar, we close out the old year and we enter in to Yom Kippur, your new beginning. And today in this service, we're going to break every curse. We're gonna break every weight. We're gonna cast off every burden. We're going to step out of the chaos of this world. We're gonna step out of all the things that this world has been shoving at us this last year. We're not gonna probably leave this planet, although we may, but spiritually and physically, we are stepping into a new year, a new beginning, and God today will break every curse in your life, everything from the world that's been trying to tug you down and set you in a new place. Are y'all ready for that? But the thing about this, I love that today, Brandon, as, as we began to worship, you could feel the Holy Spirit come and he was already here, but we just began to enter in to his presence. And what happens there? This is the time, this week is when we teshuvah. We are coming closer. That word teshuvah means to come closer to the Lord, to draw closer to him. And you literally felt that happen. All of a sudden, I opened my eyes, I looked around, and people all over were kneeling and bowing and pressing in. That's exactly what this week is all about. Amen? Let me read you something. I read this Friday night because it just says it so well. Larry has been teaching us on the high holidays and this season that we're in. Can you say amen? We're supposed to be getting ready. We're supposed to be getting ready, getting our hearts right, turning around from the things of the world. But there's a rabbi that uh, sends us emails on our, on our uh, internet, and I love this letter that he wrote. It says this, Dear friend, did you know there are 10 days in the year when our God is especially close to you? He says, in fact, we're in the middle of that right now. And I say to you, we're in the middle of that right now. He says, during the 10 days from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, God is especially close to you and to I. Didn't you feel that this morning? In fact, we're in the middle of that season right now. During the 10 days from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, prayer is accepted immediately from on high. So today, we're not only going to worship in just a minute and sing that song again. I want you literally, normally we wouldn't say this in church because we're so geared towards being positive and entering in. I want you to think about some of the stuff this year that's gone on in your life. And I want you to literally lift it to God, put it aside, and step in to his answers, his miracles. Friday night, we taught on Shabbat that literally during Shabbat, when we light the candles and we say the prayers and the women take after we've lit the candles and then we breathe in the essence of God. But during those few minutes there, we are supposed to picture 
ourselves on the other side of that prayer. Envision those prayers, your life, your family, your children, your miracle, whatever it may, it may be. For us, the last couple years, it was having the miracle of healing in Lion and in me. And the things that were going on in our lives around us, we had to literally step out of that. And as we pictured being on the other side of all that, we literally are now. Amen. So I want you to take a minute and just picture in your life, in just a minute, you stepping out and getting your new beginning. Mamadies also says that it is customary to give during this time, to perform many good deeds, but to a greater extent than during the remainder of the year. Then it goes on and it says that our sages inform us that God's response to our giving, to our offering our praise, to our pressing into him, is listen to this, it often mirrors our own initiative. You see, I love that because it's our part, God's part. God's part, our part. And so as we generously give our lives to him and to others, God has literally given his life and his blessings to us. So our worship today, press in because the extent that you press in, he's going to mirror that back into your lives. Amen. Brandon, would you just lead us one more time? Worthy just take a minute, one more time. The I exalt thee. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Just sing that with me. Come on, over. Come on, I don't want you just to stand is, there. I don't want you just to take up time today on your calendar. You're here. You're in your home. You're sitting there on the stream. Come on, I want you to press into all God has for you. Amen. Lift your hands all over this building, wherever you're at in your home. Put the dishes down, whatever's going on, and literally tabernacle with him right now. Hallelujah, my God. 
Did you feel a transformation? Maybe you're looking around, you're like, I don't see anything different. Well, we're talking about something that maybe you don't see in the natural right yet, but you see it in your spirit. And that's your deed that it is coming. It is coming. It is coming. Amen. At the end of this service today, as you can see, we've got the symbolic hand washing of the baptismal at this time of the year. That's customary is that you get baptized and you dunk that old life, all those attachments, all those ties to this last world, all those burdens. You go down and when you come up, symbolically, you are in that new place. So today we're going to hear the message and then we're going to do that. And so the guys will be at this station, the guys and gals, and you can come down. We'll just kind of quickly do your hands and, uh, but you know there's something powerful that goes on with that. Amen. I want to just, as we're moving forward in the service, let me just tell you something. This is so cool. Katie, can you bring that up, please? When talking about it's customary to, during this time, to give something special to the Lord, um, this is so cool. Y'all know that we've been supporting and working with Corinne Hesot. And that is literally where people, t literally Teshuvah, and we bring people in from all over the world that are Jews that want to go back to the homeland. This is exactly what scripture says would happen in the end times. You and I are a part of making that happen. As you know, maybe sometimes you're giving, you don't know what we're using those funds for, but I wanna tell you something that we have been using the funds and the offerings for that's going to bless your soul. So a few months ago, you all remember, well, currently we're getting all those young people out of Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, and that's our project now. But last year, we were bringing these people out of Ethiopia, bringing them out of the persecution and the oppression that they were under for being Jews in that nation, in a Muslim nation. So we brought all these folks out, well, Katie, hold that up. Sam from Corinne Hesso just sent this to us last week. If you can get a close-up on that camera. And he says, Dear Pastors Larry and Pastor Tiz, on the eve of the incoming new year, we would like to extend our sincerest wishes for happiness, health, prosperity to you, your loved ones, and your congregation, all your people. The festival of Rosh Hashanah literally is a new year. It celebrates the creation of the world. And its most outstanding symbol, the shofar, is a powerful metaphor for crowning God as the creator and the king of our lives. Amen? And the world. <laughs> At the same time, the blasts of the shofar serve as a wake-up call to us and a call to action, which is the purpose of creation. You, he's saying this to us and to you, you have mobilized to respond to the call and helped us bring our brothers and sisters from the four corners of the world. Our deepest thanks to you for helping realize the prophetic words, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you into your land, Ezekiel 36, 24. All those years ago in Ezekiel, God, as he inspired that word to come forth, he saw all the way down, all the way up to today, to you and I and those of you on stream that are all partnering with us because we have mobilized, we have stepped up to respond to the call and to the action. Oh, this just tears me up. <laughs> and we're bringing people in. We're bringing the Jews in from all over the, all over the nation to Israel. It's prophetic. It's the end times. And you and I, little, in between, huge, whatever we're giving, you are making this happen. Our deepest thanks to you for helping realize these words. Enclosed, you'll find an Ethiopian handmade artwork made especially by the new immigrants for you. 
Blessings from Jerusalem for a happy, blessed, and prosperous year. So this is a tapestry that they designed, the people that you and I brought in, that they designed and then created as a gift to those who helped to make it happen for them to be there. So give yourselves, give yourselves a clap. <laughs> and thank you for what you have done, what you are doing, and what you're going to do. And today we have the Stead Cobb boxes. And if you choose to uh, give something towards this particular project, which these people are already there, but we're bringing them in all over the, all over the world and all the time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for all you're doing to fulfill end time prophecy. Amen? Amen? So let's give the Lord another praise offering. Thank you for being here. And guess what? Pastor isn't here today, so he will be here. He came in this week and taped this message just for us today. So please be seated. It won't take that long, and it's going to be a whopper of a message. Amen? Hey, everybody, I want to welcome you not only in the sanctuary here, but literally around the world for an amazing, amazing teachings. We're going to turn to the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. And, you know, this really, when we're talking about returning to our Jewish roots and understanding a Jewish Jesus, this scripture right here that we read, that everyone reads during the celebration of Yom Kippur is the most amazing teaching that shouts that Jesus was born Jewish, Jesus grew up Jewish, Jesus lived Jewish, taught Jewish, died Jewish, and was resurrected this, Jewish. This teaching and the scripture from Leviticus 16 on Yom Kippur shouts of us returning to our Jewish roots. Now, I want to, before we read, I want you to go to the calendar and I want you to look at what we, what we have here. For 30 days during the month of Elul, we would blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm. And I know I keep saying this over and over again. And, and I'm going to say it a lot more because we're getting ready to do a series on the seven churches of Revelations. And I'm going to teach on the Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke versus the Jesus in Revelation. And it is eye-opening. But when you look at everything that's going on around the world, you've got to understand that the blowing of the shofar is symbolic. The sounding of the alarm is symbolic of what we're seeing, what we call in, in the New Testament, the birth pangs of the birthing of the coming of the Messiah. Now, we've gone through 30 days of Elul. We've gone through 10 days of Rosh Hashanah or nine days of Rosh Hashanah. Actually, we're teaching this on Sunday. Uh, your, uh, Yom Kippur begins on Wednesday. And so that is a completion of 40 days. Now, Remember that the blowing of the shofar is a shadow of the birth pangs. And, you know, you think about COVID, you think about the, uh, the COVID passports, you think about uh, the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, you think about uh, the abandoning of our, our government in Afghanistan, of Americans. You think about all these things that we've read about, but we thought we would never see in our lifetime. We're seeing them right now. So this is a shadow of the birth pangs. God's saying, get ready. I'm about to birth something. Rosh Hashanah is a shadow of the rapture. Yom Kippur is a shadow of the second coming. And then, of course, Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, is a shadow of the wedding supper of the Lamb. Now, and I say this all the time, and I really believe this. I believe because Passover happened during Jesus died on the cross, was resurrected. Passover, exactly the way the Lord said it would happen. Pentecost, the day of Shavuot happened on the, the day of Pentecost was, had fully come. I believe that this is an example that the rapture 
will take place on Rosh Hashanah. Now, obviously, you're watching this getting ready for Yom Kippur. You're watching this on Sunday. But what I want you to understand is even though we're together right now on Sunday, the reality of it is, is that I'm teaching this in the church on Tuesday morning. So I'm teaching this right here. Now, the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. That, the reason it says that is because Rosh Hashanah is not one day, but two days. So the reality of it is, is that even though you're watching this on Sunday, we're still hours away from the end of Rosh Hashanah. What does that mean? That means that it's very possible it could happen that the rapture could still take place. Remember, I'm, I'm with you. I'm here right now on Tuesday. We have hours before sundown. And so that means that the rapture still could take place even before I finish this. You know, we did that same thing for the Shabbat service, Shabbat Teshuvah on Friday, but I know a lot of you didn't get to see it, so I thought I'd do it again. But, you know, the reality of it is, is someday this really is going to happen. Now, like I said, we're here on Tuesday. Uh, maybe it's going to happen before the sun goes down today. But if it doesn't happen, remember that on Rosh Hashanah, it's symbolic of the rapture. On Yom Kippur, it's symbolic of the second coming. The rapture is us going up. Yom Kippur is us coming down. And we've now, once we get to Wednesday, Yom Kippur, we have gone through 40 days of blowing the trumpet in Zion, of sounding the alarm, and God saying, wake up. Now, Another reason I believe that it all matches with um, a shadow of things to come is that 40 days from the blowing of the shofar to the second coming, the rapture, then the second coming is not coincidental. It's there by purpose because every time we read in the Bible something about 40 days it is very, very significant. Look at this. Noah, 40 days and 40 nights, it rained and he was in the ark. Moses, 40 days interceding on Mount Sinai for the children of Israel. 12 spies spied out the land, the promised land, for 40 days. Goliath stood and defies uh, Israel for 40 days. Jonah warns Nineveh for 40 days. Jesus was in the uh, wilderness for 40 days. Jesus appeared after the resurrection for 40 days. And so we look at this and whether the rapture has taken place or, uh, or it hasn't taken place, what you've got to understand is this day is very, very significant to the world and to your life. The rabbis say, you know, the Bible says, call upon the Lord while he is near. The rabbis, ancient Jewish wisdom teaches that God will forgive us and touch us every day, but there is never a day that God is closer to us than Yom Kippur. You think about once that rapture takes place, then the second coming happens. We will never be closer to the Messiah because from that moment on, you and I will rule and reign with Christ. And so this is so significant that we understand the power of Yom Kippur, but we also understand Jesus shouting to us about the miracles and the significance of Yom Kippur. Read with me in Leviticus chapter 16, and I'm just going to skip around a little bit for the sake of time, starting with verse 5. This is Yom Kippur. And by the way, Yom Kippur means the Day of Atonement. And so you're watching this on Sunday. You still have a period of time before Wednesday comes that you become at one with God. Are you at one with God? Is your heart, 
your actions, your finances, your tithe, your family, your, your business, your everything. Are you at one with the will of God? And, and I, I meant to teach this on Friday, but let me throw this in. The reason for us returning is that before every one of us were born, the moment before we were conceived, ancient Jewish wisdom says our souls stood before God and God gave us a mission. And all of us, if you're watching right now, anywhere around the world, or you're sitting here, it's because you have been drawn to be a part of the mission to change the world, to stand for the kingdom of God, to love Jesus with all your heart, and stand with the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. Let's read in Leviticus 16, verse 5. And he shall take, this is Yom Kippur. This is the, 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 cel- this is the, the high priest at the temple on Yom Kippur. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering, one ram as a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. Aaron's obviously the high priest. And, and let me just throw something in. I don't, God doesn't care if you call yourself New Beginnings or Baptist or Lutheran or Presbyterian, but let me say something for all of us who are, quote, unquote, the high priest of our church. Stand up for God. Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for what the word of God says. Don't let the world pull you aside. Stand up for what is right. Because the Bible says, be not many teachers. Don't be many rabbis. Don't be many pastors, for greater is your condemnation. This is not, if you're a pastor or you're a rabbi, this is not a job, it's a calling. And Aaron is saying, first I'm making atonement that I become one with God. And I release the blessing of God on every pastor and every rabbi. All right. Then Aaron shall, and he said, he shall take the two goats, verse 7, and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. Now, for the sake of time, go to verse 14. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. And before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger. How many times does it say? Say it. Seven times. Verse 15. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, and do with the blood as he did with the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat before the mercy seat. Verse 16. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness for the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. So he shall do for the tabernacle of the meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Jump down to verse 19. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger. How many times? Seven times. Cleanse it, sanctify it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he has made an end of the atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. This is the second goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it the iniquities of the children of Israel. Now, remember, he was wounded. There's the blood for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The word iniquity best understood is a curse. Every sin committed brings a curse with it. So the Lord is not just forgiving the sin. He wants to break the curse. Now look at this. Verse 21. Let me read it again. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities, the curses of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. Then God shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, 
and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Now, I've never said this before, but read, read, uh, read verse, read the end of verse 21 again. It says, and he shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. I had somebody that I really respect spiritually and, and in every day say, Pastor Larry, it, God has given you a revelation of Jesus on Yom Kippur. And he's also given you years ago the revelation of breaking family curses. And so I want to ask you to receive right now what I'm teaching, that God is not only going to prepare us for the wedding supper of the Lamb, God's not only going to bless your first fruit offerings come the Feast of Tabernacles, but every curse is going to be broken today in the name that's above every name. All right, now let me show you Yom Kippur here. Here we have the high priest at the temple, and I'm going to say this very quickly. He's ready for the day of atonement. This is the most important day. This is a shadow of the Lord coming and ruling and reigning. Someday he will come and rule and reign. But I believe that in this craziness that we're living in, God is saying, you may be in this world, but you're not of this world. When you return to me, I am going to come with my power, with my strength and rule and reign. I really believe we have entered in to the latter rain, signs and wonders and miracles, end time transfer of wealth. So here we have this symbolically right now. And here's Aaron, the high priest, and he's at the door of the temple. The door of the temple is your heart. You're the temple of God now. And they bring two sacrifices, two goats or two lambs. And the Bible says that they cast lots and Aaron out of the two picks one and brings that lamb or brings that goat, brings that sacrifice in and lays that sacrifice on the altar. He then kills that sacrifice. The one is still alive. He kills that sacrifice and the blood and the death and the life of that sacrifice releases every year the forgiveness of God on all the nation of Israel. But I want you to see this. Now, at this point, he is covered in blood. And so he leaves. The, the sins are forgiven. But God has more. It, it, and I say this all the time. If all God did was forgive us of our sin, we couldn't praise him enough. We couldn't worship him enough. He's going to get us into heaven. But he's come to give us life and life more abundant. And we see that right here in this teaching. And it is a shadow of what Jesus did and is going to do. The, 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 the lamb, the, the goat, the sacrifice is dead. The sins of Israel are forgiven. And that's where most of us stop. But it's time to move into that life more abundant. He's now covered in blood. The high priest goes and changes his clothing, washes in the mikvah, in the baptismal. It's the, the mikvah, the baptism was called in Hebrew, the womb of the world. He comes out and he is clean and pure. And he's wearing now all white. Listen to what the Bible says in Isaiah 1, 18. Come now. Let us reason together, though your, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So now the word of God says that he is totally clean, he's fully white, and he's about to ascend into the holy of holies, into the very presence of of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now think about Jesus. Jesus is on the cross. He dies for our sin. He is covered in blood. He's been beaten like no man's been beaten. They've nailed him, pressed the crown of thorns, nailed his hands, nailed his feet. When they bury him, he is covered in blood. But when Mary comes and sees the stone rolled away, 
and she sees what she thinks is an angel, but it's the Lord. He is no longer covered in blood, but he is pure white, like an angel. And what does Mary say, or what does Jesus say? When Mary rushes to him, he says, touch me not, for I have not yet been to the Father. When the high priest sacrifices that lamb or that goat, he's covered in blood. He takes those clothings off. And by the way, the, uh, the, the clothing that the high priest wears at this time that's covered in blood, it's called swaddling cloth. He takes it off. What was Jesus wrapped in when he was born, when our Messiah was born? Swaddling cloth. It's a, and they use it to light the big candelabras on the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll talk about that later. He goes into the mikvah. It's called being born again. That's what it's called. You come out, none of the curses of this world are, are on you anymore. Even though he touched sin, now he's cleansed. And he comes out, he dips his finger into the blood of that sacrificial lamb. He's about to enter into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. And what does he say? He says to all around him, touch me not, because he's not yet been in the presence of the Father. When Jesus rose again from the dead and Mary sees him and he's cleansed, no wounds, no blood, in, in white linen, what does Jesus say? Touch me not. It's shouting that Jesus is our high priest and what is happening on Yom Kippur, we need to realize is happening right now in every one of our lives. When, when the high priest dips his finger into that blood, he goes into the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies is the ark the, the, the presence of God. In the ark are the, 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 the broken pieces that Moses originally had in the Ten Commandments. In the Holy of Holies, the Holy Spirit is hovering over the ark of the covenant, representing the power of God. He goes in and he takes the blood of our sacrificial lamb and he sprinkles that blood seven times. How many places did Jesus shed his blood? Seven times in the garden, at the whipping post, crown of thorns, in his hands, in his feet, in his side. And then he stumped on the devil's forehead, bruised his heel. Remember, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. And he took the keys of life and death. He took the keys of poverty or prosperity, sickness, or health, sadness, or joy, defeat, or victory, and he takes them and he holds them up because you and I, even though we're in this world, are more than conquerors. Now, let me show you something very, very quickly. The seven places Jesus shed his blood. The first place Jesus shed his blood was in the garden. In the garden of Eden, Adam said, not your will, but my will, and he ate the forbidden fruit. We go to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus, the second Adam, so many say, said, not, your, not my will, but your will be done, and the Bible said he sweat great drops of blood. When I realized that the blood of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, I lost my willpower. Once they told my mom and dad, your son's a drug addict, the world said once a junkie, always a junkie. But when I found out that Jesus regained my willpower, Adam said, not your will, but my will. And Satan became the, the ruler of all mankind. But in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, not my will, but your will. He sweat drops of blood and he bought back my willpower. The world said, your son's a junkie, once a junkie, always a junkie. But the word says, I don't care what the world says. The word says, who the son sets free shall be free indeed. We're going to break every curse over you, your family. It may be drugs, alcohol. It may be anger, depression, whatever it is. God is going to set that willpower free. Then we look at the crown of thorns. We're cursed 
by the sweat of Adam's brow, thorns and thistles. We're redeemed by the blood. They took the very curse. God cursed the land with thorns and thistles. God divorced himself from all mankind of being Jehovah Jireh. And then we have Jesus. They took the symbol of poverty and lack. Listen to me. The Bible says uh, he would that we become rich, that we become prosperous. Beloved, I would above all things that you prosper and be in health as your soul does prosper. I don't think there's ever more an important time than right now when we cannot trust what's happening in the world. We can't trust Wall Street. We can't trust uh, uh, um, Washington, but we can trust him to be Jehovah Jireh. And we claim that every curse be broken off your finances. We're, we're cursed by the sweat of Adam's brow. They took that curse, pressed it on the brow of Jesus, and out came not sweat, but blood, and were redeemed from the curse. Then the Bible says they nailed his hands and they nailed his feet. They didn't have nails in those days. They couldn't go down to Lowe's and buy nails. The normal way that Rome crucified the Jews and they crucified tens and tens and tens of thousands of them was to hang them. But they nailed Jesus. In ancient Hebrew, there's no word for what? coincidence. Why? Because through the blood of Jesus, he said, everything you put your hands to, I will cause it to prosper. They nailed his feet. Why? Every place you put the sole of your feet, he said, I'll give it to you for inheritance. Wherever you go, tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Father, I release an anointing on every person in this room, every person watching around the world, that you realize that you are not just nobody, you're not just somebody, you are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. And Jesus said, as my father sent me with power and anointing and strength, so I send you. Father, let there be a new resurrection of the power and the anointing of all Almighty God on every one of us that are followers of the Lord and the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Then they pierced this side, and out of that wound came blood and water. Around every person's heart is a sack of water. When they pierced Jesus' side to see if he really was dead, because he wasn't supposed to be dead yet. It takes days to die from a crucifixion. They broke the legs on the thief on the right. They broke the legs on the thief on the left. But the Bible says on the Lord, the Messiah, no bone would be broken. So they went to break his legs, but it looked like he was already dead. So they took a spear and pierced his side to see if he was really dead, see if he'd flinch. And out of that wound didn't just come blood, but come blood and water. Listen to me carefully. Why blood and water? Because Jesus did not die from the hands of man. Jesus died from a broken heart of taking the weight of my sin and your sin on him. And that's why when his heart broke, out of that wound came blood and water. The devil forgot that the Bible says that the, when the, our Messiah, when our Lord and Savior hung on the cross, that he would buy back everything the devil stole, that he would come and, hear this, heal the brokenhearted. Maybe some of you have gone through some terrible things, especially in the last couple years with COVID and the finances and the economy. I'm here to tell you he has come to redeem what the devil has broken in your heart and give you a new heart and starting today, a new beginning in Jesus' name. And then the last thing, the Bible says that when Adam and Eve fell, God prophesied over Satan. And he said, my son will come and he will stomp your forehead and bruise his heel. You read that in the original Hebrew. It says, when my son comes, he will crush you. He will crush you. I am sick and tired of people being afraid of the devil or afraid of what this person will do or that person will do. God says, when my son comes, and it's time for us to realize this, he will crush the devil that's coming against you, your family, your business, your health, your finances, whatever it is. And when he crushes the devil's head, he will bruise his heel. Why? He was wounded. All the blood of Jesus came to wash our sins away, but the bruise 
was here, came to break the iniquity, wounded for what we've done, our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, the curses that cause us to do this. When I was a drug addict, or even worse, when I was full of anger and I was a violent person, and a lot of people don't believe that, but I was. But Jesus didn't just forgive me of my drugs. He didn't just forgive me of my anger. He delivered me. When Jesus hung on that cross, he said these words, it is finished. And the Bible says that he gave up his spirit into the hands of the Father. But listen to this. It's finished. If all Jesus was going to do was forgive us of our sin, he wouldn't have to bled in the garden. He wouldn't have to bled with the crown of thorns. He wouldn't have to bleed with the hands and the feet and his side. He wouldn't have had to go and stomp on the devil's forehead and take the keys of victory or defeat. He did that because the Bible says, cursed is he who hangs on a tree. This is why the Pharisees wanted Jesus off that cross. They were saying, no, he's not the Messiah. No, he's not the Messiah. But just in case, they didn't want any curse that was on him for hanging on a cross if the Sabbath began to come down onto them. But I want you to know something. Jesus didn't just take my sin or your sin. Jesus took our curses. And I declare to you, whatever it is that's coming against you, maybe it's a family curse. Maybe it's a generational curse. Maybe it's a, 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 a curse that has been around your family of drugs or alcohol or failure or poverty or divorce or illegitimacy or anger or depression, whatever it is. Understand that through Jesus and his blood, we are forgiven. But by Jesus hanging on that cross, Jesus said, I'm not only forgiving you, I am breaking the curse. And I've come to give you life and that life more abundant. Now, let me close with one more thing. Can we, we've got the calendar up here. We are right here. This is where we are today. If I'm not here, if I'm not live, it's because I've already been raptured and you missed it. No, no. Sorry, Tiz, I didn't mean that. This is Yom Kippur. This is when it's sealed. Everything that God is getting ready to do is going to be released right in here and seal it where the devil can't steal it. Now, come Feast of Tabernacles, when we bring that first fruit, it is a first fruit offering of thanks. It covers everything. It's like what God has planned for you, when we bring this first fruit offering, it turbocharges it. But right here is called the day of fast. This is where the prophet says, is this not the fast which I have chosen? If you, if you have time, read Isaiah 58. He said, when you fast on this day, when you fast, why, why do we fast? It's to remind our flesh what it feels like without God feeding us, taking care of us. It's just for 24 hours, 25 hours. But it's to afflict our soul so that at the end of the fast on Yom Kippur, our soul can be lifted up and make aliyah with him. Is this not the fast which I have chosen? Now, there is, and we can do, you can do this today, you can send it in, you can call in, whatever. There is an offering that's called the keporot offering that we, you do on this. Now, it's not the first fruit, it's a keporot offering. The keporot, the, is, uh, you know, I just took off the white for the high priest. This is called the kippah. It's to cover you. When they would go into the Holy of Holies, the covering over the Holy of Holies is called the, the, um, the keporot. There's an offering that we do on this day to say, God, we give you all the praise and all the glory. Say, well, what is that offering? Well, it used to be 
a dove or it used to be a lamb or something like that. And what it is, is saying, I'm going to give to the Lord for the poor what I would spend on a meal. So figure out on this fast, is this not the fast which I have chosen to set the captive free? That's us. And we take what we'd spend for breakfast and lunch and dinner and we bring it to the Lord. You can do that today. You can do that this week. You can send it and call it in. But I want to tell you this. Get ready. Because I know there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world. But I'm going to prophesy to you the us who are saying, you know what? I need to get serious about serving God with all my heart with all my strength, with all my mind, with all my might, I need to get serious about serving God. God is going to seal your blessing. The devil will not be able to steal it. And come the Feast of Tabernacles, and we're going to do this live here. We're going to set everything up for it. Come the Feast of Tabernacles, it really will be a celebration of our marriage to the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you give the Lord a clap offering? Really, your best is yet to come. God bless. Hey, everybody, I want to welcome you. What's that here for God? You know, would you stand with me? What a great message. You know, can I just say something to you? Am I on or no? Okay. Can I just say something to you? Thank you. How's that? No, no, no. Hello, hello. (laughs) Can I just say something to you? (laughs) Let me just say this. God is not a taker. God is a giver. Check, 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 check. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. You guys are kind of quiet today. (laughs) This is good news, everybody. This is good, good, good news. Amen. You know, I talked to someone earlier this week, and they said, you know, I've kind of gotten away from the Lord. I haven't really, you know, been going to church. I haven't done, but I still love him in my heart, you know. And I said, you know what, that is fine. God loves you, how you are, who you are, where you're at. But it's not about to-do lists. It's not about I have to I have to go to church. It's about we get to come into the house of God, meet with Him, put Him first in our lives every single day so that we come closer to Him so that He can come closer to us, not just in the spiritual realm or the emotional realm, in the reality of our lives. I said, "Hun, you you're missing out. Yes, God understands you're busy. You have children, you have all these things, work, jobs, but you're missing out on his best. He's not mad at you, but he wants more for you. So would you lift your hands? I love when we hear the word, when we hear the message, Larry talked about the Cape of Road offering. I love sealing what God has done. So even if you're serving God absolutely with all your heart, let's rededicate right now to a higher level to come into his presence. But guess what? Not to just keep it to ourselves. Let's share it with the world. Amen. Father, repeat this after me. Say, Father, I receive that word today, and I break every curse, every addiction, every bondage, every distraction keeping me from the fullness of God in my life, in my mind, in my heart, in my finances, in my job, in my serving you, in my family, in Jesus name and I release the goodness the fullness and the dedication and the honor of serving you with all my heart and as I pour myself into you and honor you I know 
you will pour your spirit out on me and honor me as I give my best in Jesus name. Now give him a shout, a shout of praise. <laughs> Amen. Amen. What a great service. Now what we do is we're going to have you file down. Wanderson is going to come and tell you how to do this. And so with just a real quick symbolic, we don't want to actually do baptismals, you know, with, you know, all that's going on, COVID and all that jazz. But this is not just getting your hands wet. This is baptizing. When you get those hands wet, you are submitting that old life and coming up as a resurrected new person. Amen? So Wanderson, come and tell them how to file down. And we appreciate and love y'all so much. And then there's Stead Call Boxes. You can give that offering so we can keep doing these projects getting these kids in from Ethiopia, from all over the world. And God will bless you for being a blessing. Amen. Yes. Okay. Some of you couldn't be right here with us today in the service. So as the stream pastor, I'm going to stand in proxy for you as Pastor Scott and Pastor Lydia baptize my hands. I'm doing it for you. We're breaking every curse. So get ready. You ready? Pastor Scott. You're going to exit towards the walls. Okay? Pastor Lydia, will you hold this? Left right. You drop your offering. Father, get your hand washed. Get baptized. For forgiving you every go. sin, breaking you every curse, and, and releasing ready. every this, blessing. This we, we in Jesus' no name. Amen. Receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you. Listen. Thank you so much. God bless you. And we'll see you next Sunday. Bye now.